Hello, everybody out there in YouTube land. This is your t-shirt historian, and I'm very proud. This is a really momentous day for me. So um, let me tell you a little story before we get started here. Um, I'm 19 years old. It's uh, Origins 92, I think, or 91, maybe. I can't remember. But it's my first really big con that I've ever been to. In fact, it's pretty much like one of the only cons I've ever been to. I've only been to like three or four of them my whole lifetime. I know that sounds really sad for a gamer, but, uh, you know, hey, gas money being what it is. But I made it to Origins, and I'm standing in line for one of the events, and, you know... I've already I've said many times about how I, I missed my opportunity to talk to Mike Pondsmith when I had a chance. Well, I also missed an opportunity to talk to another guy because I'll never forget the first time I saw Mark Reinhagen. Uh, he was wearing combat boots and uh, camouflage pants and some kind of what looked like military type sweater type thing. And he looked really intimidating and. Here I am, 19 years old. I'm just about to piss my pants because, uh, you know, this guy is just, you know, like Vampire was brand new pretty much at that point. And I could tell you now, it's like the very first edition that we ever had. Uh, we were photocopying the hell out of my friends until I could get my own. And uh, the plastic was coming off that cover and everything. And there's, there's the creator sitting not too far from me. And you know what? I... I didn't say anything. I wanted to, but the guy looked like he was busy. He looked intimidating, and, and I missed my shot, man. And that was... That was back in... Yeah, I guess that was back in 91, 92. So, today is kind of like the uh, fulfillment of a little dream for me, because today I'm actually getting to talk to him, getting to meet him for the first time. So, hey, how are you, Mark? Good, good. How are you? <laughs> Dude, I'm, I'm my heart's jumping right now. I'm I'm really excited about this. This is really cool. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm delighted to be here. Unfortunately, uh, uh, I don't have any of my uh, standard black shirts, so I, I wore my church shirt. <laughs> well, that's okay. I'm here with my mother right now in Minnesota, so we're uh, we're we're back to being a church mark for a while. All right. Well, man, uh, I was hoping we'd have a, a larger audience for this because I figured, you know, we had it all hyped up and everything. We had people who were interested, and in, uh, but that's okay. Maybe they'll we'll we'll pick them up as we go. They'll wander we in. Go. Yeah, we got Trisandra Davis. Hello, good morning, new person, Nathan Hook. Nice to meet you. All right. I guess these are some of your fans. Uh, Trisandra's somebody on the Lost Learn team. She oh wow! I recognize the name. And uh, Nathan's well known in the Ars Magica world. Oh, I remember Ars Magica. I never got to play it, but uh, but I did get to hear all about it because some of my friends were playing it. Oh man, golly! So vampire, wow. Um, it's almost hard to talk about because uh, that was such a long time ago. But it's such a is such a pivotal point in my, you know, in my role playing history because I remember at that time, just to kind of put it into context, what it's like AD and D uh, was trying to move through second edition and they were releasing all kinds of garbage like, you know, Ravenloft and, well, I call it garbage, but I love it. Wait, but, what? Uh, <laughs> Dark Suns and uh, Alternity and everything else and. Ravenloft. Yeah, I mean, at the, in the '90s, people forget that sort of D and D had just come off of its big boom period in the the '80s, but it kind of TSR kind of run out of steam, and uh, things were in the late '80s, early '90s. You know, TSR was kind of floundering, and uh, the whole industry was like worried and 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 sort of, hey, what? How are we going to survive? What's going to happen next? You know how can we sort of keep going? And and uh, and TSR was just basically being run by a series of you know uh, incompetent CEOs who were just trying to milk it and didn't understand how to do things. Uh, Lorraine 
comes to mind. I don't know if everyone knows. Oh, that. Lorraine it's Williams. Hard to talk about that era of. But yeah, but, uh, her but yeah, like like um, like Vampire coming out was a seismic event, you know. And for for me, riding the 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 tidal wave coming in was was wild, you know. It was definitely uh, you know it's in my early twenties and. Uh, um, you know, I kind of knew what I was doing. I, I told everyone this is going to happen. I said, I'm going to bring girls into gaming. No one believed me. I said, I'm going to change gaming. No one believed me. I'm going to do a storytelling style role playing game. No one thought that would be popular. Um, and uh, I was right on every one. But what the funny thing is, even though I was right and I predicted it, I was more shocked than anyone that it actually worked. Because, you know, there was more than a little bravado in my, you know, you know, I was trying to convince everyone else and myself it was true. And, and even though intellectually I believed in it, emotionally, I think I, I was like, yeah, you, even if you only get a couple thousand people buying it, at least, you know, you change gaming for them and yourself. But then when it sort of became this phenomenon, um, yeah, it was mind blowing. You know, I went from during the writing of Vampire, I didn't even have a car. You know, I had to walk to Waffle House, like a mile. Um, Christmas dinner that year, um, I had to take the extra um, rolls of pennies we had in our change box, and I had to walk to Waffle House for Christmas dinner, paid the, paid for them with rolls of pennies, which they <laughs> made me crack open so they could count the pennies to make sure I wasn't cheating. <laughs> I didn't anyway, trust you. I went from that to you know um, a couple years later. Well, I mean, a few months later, having a car um, and and having a life, having a girlfriend. You know, it was like a, it was a, it was pretty awesome. You know. Yeah i I think I've actually um, like heard a few um, apocryphal stories about those days. It's like. Uh, when you guys were set up originally, uh, it was like what five of you guys were like sharing the same apartment or something, and or the same house. Yeah, we had the same house. Uh, we the start all started sort of in Minnesota at Saint Olaf College, where a lot of people who are big in the industry um, now all sort of came from. Lisa Stevens, who was instrumental in early White Wolf, and uh, um, was at the Coast, and then now owns Paizo. Um, she was part of the crew, uh, John Nephew, who owns Atlas Games, uh, Jonathan Tweet, um, who, uh, that, who did yeah. third edition uh, D&D, and, um, you know, um, Nicole Lindrus, who runs uh, Green Ronin, I think, is it called? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, that was basically, and then, uh, you know, um, we had our Smajica, but it just wasn't selling enough to support us, so... Uh, I decided to uh, merge with Stuart, let him deal with the business side. Well, I decided to do our, I would, you know, spend a year, it ended up being nine months, writing the big game. Um, and that initially started out as Inferno, where you basically play someone in hell. Wow. But that's when the Wraith curse began, and there was so much bad luck, including a Domino's pizza truck fell, he didn't put the brake on, at our neighbor's house, it rolled down the hill into electrical transformer, and it blew up every single electric or electronic device in the house. Every single one. It was this beautiful rental house that we somehow got, but we were just screwed, man. It was just awful. It was the worst thing ever. Uh, and we, um, uh, I made a deal with Domino's in two days, and that is that if they paid us immediately. Uh, we would sue them. So I was able to negotiate a deal with them for, you know, uh, pennies off the dollar. But, hey, it got us our money right away. And um, we were able to keep going. So wow. anyway, after that, I decided, okay, I, I can't do Inferno. What can I do? And it was on the way to Gen Con. I came with the idea of Vampire. And that's the one Gen Con I didn't have any fun. Except that I was having the most fun of my life. Because I was sitting there with notebooks, writing down the game basically just full time and uh, i could barely talk to anyone because no one understood what the hell i was doing they kind of knew i was working on something called vampire um but basically they just brought me notebooks when i needed a new notebook brought me pens and needed a new pen would bring me coffee and i pretty much stayed at the booth or in my room and i just wrote i filled up notebook after notebook after notebook and it just sort of 
you know, all those years of game design and, and thinking about gaming and how I want how what I what my approach to gaming was, and it just all, all built up. And then it was like unlocking a lock. This, you know, once you open the chest, all this torrent of things just come pouring out. And um, yeah, and then nine months later, we printed, and then that Gen Con, um, the following year, that was the the big one. That's sort of you know, that's when everyone came up to me, in the gaming industry. And when, where did all the girls come from, Mark? Why are there so many girls at our convention? And uh, it wasn't, it was amazing. Like, you know, overnight, Gen Con went from a mostly boy thing to a mixed thing. And, and now today, of course, it's, I believe it's probably 50 50, you know, which is, which is fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, then people still accuse us of gatekeeping and stuff like that. It's like, uh, no, guys, we, we wanted girls at our tables and stuff like that. It's just uh, they didn't want to hang around with the smelly glasses, you know, acne, you know, guys talking about Thacko and everything in the corner. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'll never forget the first time my sister came down to our gaming house in, in Minnesota and like two guys both sat down next to her on the couch and started like leaning in and she looked at me and I was like, you two get away from my sister until you have a shower. It's <laughs> like, she is not here for you to like practice your lines, like in the corner. So oh Mark, gosh. Mark, I had a question for you. So I've read that uh, it was actually your AD and D campaign in the eighties that gave you a lot of ideas for uh, Ars Magica and Storyteller. Is that true? Did you have kind of a more narrative uh, focus when you were playing D&D? Or? Yeah, yeah. I was running a, a D&D campaign until my group uh, in Minnesota kicked me out because it was too storytelling and they just wanted hack and slash. So I literally lost my group. And then I moved to Australia uh, and uh, I got a new group there. I was an exchange student in Australia for a year and I ran D&D there. And that's when I sort of brought that campaign back. So basically Lorne which is the, the Lost Lauren setting, began then. And, you know, a lot of the basic ideas were, were all there. Uh, Grandmother Oak, a, a giant tempest storm circling the continent, you know, at a high speed, um, through a, a barrier through which, you know, only a few ships can get past. Um, and, uh, and all these people sort of left there from different worlds. Um, and then we changed that so they're only from Earth. But, of course, people in their own campaigns they can make it to be anywhere, any of their D and D campaigns. They can bring people in if they want. So, yeah, it basically, um, a surprising amount sort of is, is left over, and uh, you know, it's kind of cool that I was able to have uh, enough of an idea of of the big picture of how to make a world that I, even at that young age I was able to do it. Now, of course, I mean, it, uh, what we've done is informed by all my you know, more mature ideas as well. You know, I'm not trying to say this is some juvenile world created by a 13 year old, but, but the genesis of it was from then. That's pretty cool. So uh, in Australia, you were playing, you brought the ca the campaign setting back basically uh, with a new group. Can you give us some insights on how you played? Like how you actually, you were the DM, right? I guess. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. I'm almost always the DM. Um, <laughs> although I love playing, it's just that, uh, you know, um, I, I, I have a certain style that I like, which is, you know, um, I like players to not be looking up stuff. Like, I don't like people to look up stuff in, in the books during the game. Um, mm -hmm. I think that people tend to get too fixated on, oh, I have this cross profici prof proficiency, and then everything they do, they want to use their crossbow. Okay, I'm hanging from the tree with one hand. Well, I use my crossbow. And it's sort of like <laughs> I want people to think and be creative. And, you know, they, they pick up that that shank of pork from off the table. And and then they, 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 they basically use that as a club, you know. I don't want them to sort of uh, – I want to be more creative and involved. And so that means uh, I don't like people to use um, books. Uh, if someone reads rules out to me, um then they don't get called on again for a while you know like do not read me rules even my own rules like that's not cool like and, and you know the whole great thing about a uh 
a role playing game, I mean, unlike a computer game or a board game, is that you have a game master, what we call a tail spinner, sitting right there, you know, who can invent whatever you want. And so there really isn't, you know, it, it should be more about rulings than rules, right? You have someone there who can give rulings. So, so my style is very much um, the rules are there to give you good ideas, but, but don't you dare try to use them during the game. <laughs> Yeah, it makes sense. So anyway, yeah, I have a very different style. You can see in Vampire how that is. Like I, you know, basically, you know, the you know, combat is just meant to be just take an ability plus a skill, roll your dice, and then you make up stuff from there. You know, and so people always said, Oh, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And it's like, well, it works if you play it my way, which is, you know, basically roles are there to just sort of help guide the narrative flow, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, things like humanity and uh, health levels and all that are just there to sort of um, create dramatic tension. <laughs> plus, plus one pork loin of smiting. <laughs> yeah, that that, that, needs to, that needs to be in a Badlander game sometime. Yeah, Definitely. You know, back, back in the old days, uh, back in the eighties, there were some ideas by, of course. Uh, Tracy and Laura Hickman, their group in uh, Utah, had a lot of narrative ideas for D and D. But uh, it looks like you totally went in a full storytelling direction, which is like so. That's awesome how you just took what you were doing uh, in D and D and turned it in. No, you took all the ideas from your own campaign and made it something that you're working on almost uh, thirty five yeah, years later. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it really is sort of the old school Renaissance style of, you know, let's simplify this down as much as possible. So, you know, um, Pathfinder 2 kind of went in a more crunchy direction than than 5e, and we're going much more in the storytelling direction. And in our future games, we're going to go even more so that way. Like, Badlander is almost like, hey, we're going to meet people halfway. We're going to do the storytelling. But, but we're going to let people have these powers and sort of some of this crunch that they kind of want. But as we go through the series of games, and this is a this is a seven game series, well, actually eight if you count Badlander, starting with the Fang Knight. So then we're going to go more and more storytelling as we go, and uh, and make it sort of, um, uh, yeah, sort of try to get people to you know the the the, the, the more abstract and simple the rules. I think the more people tend to role play. Like, this is just true. Like, you can, and I spent a lot of time watching people game. And because uh, online now you can do that. And it just is absolutely clear that the, the sort of the less you can bog players down in the rules, the more creative they get. And the more creative they get, the more dramatic and storytelling the experience. And so that's what you want to push people towards. And people tend to want these rules and these, and these complex character sheets where you know, everything on there because it, it makes them feel like, oh, no matter what, I'll know what to do, right? But it's a false sense of security. And so that's why, you know, if you know my games, you know I'm really big on a simple-looking character sheet, you know, which is why we have the dots. Just like with Vampire, we have dots in, in, in this system so that this, the character sheet is not filled with numbers. Because we gamers tend to think that, oh, everyone likes numbers. I like numbers. And I personally, I love math. Right, I'm a huge math guy, um, so for me, numbers is not scary. But for the average person who you want to lure into gaming, numbers are scary. They see a number on something, it's scary. But if all they see is dots and almost no numbers, ah, uh, suddenly the character sheet is a lot less scary. It's more of a visual metaphor than a numbers thing. And you're going to get that extra 30% of people who would not play the game if they had a character sheet full of numbers, which they might be dyslexic towards numbers. Lots of people are, right? And so we're, I'm trying to, and design-wise, to, to basically make the game as approachable and simple and feel as elegant as possible so the maximum number of people can feel comfortable playing it and not get sucked into these, what I consider, wrong paths, you know? Which, which are basically um, the only things that you do as a character are things listed on your character sheet. Yeah, I can, I can understand that. Um, we've been, at my own table, we've been playing uh, third edition or Pathfinder first edition for such a long time that the rules crunch is kind of like ingrained into our brain now uh, to where we're just kind of used to it. 
but um i myself personally find my you know find that i'm kind of tired of it um mostly because we have players who just abuse those rules because they know them so well. Um, you know, and it's just like, you know, the more rules that you give somebody, the more opportunities you have for them to um, misuse them or use them in a way that it becomes really irritating. Like, Oh no, you can't do that because you, you know, you already took a five foot step and all this other garbage. And I'm just like, so I myself, am going, have gone back to OSR. I started with castles and crusades and now I'm, playing uh, Worlds Without Number and Godbound and Kevin, all of Kevin Crawford's stuff, because I just absolutely love it. Um, yeah, I am yeah that's, sort of, that's sort of the direction we're going in as well. And, and But we're trying to do it in a way so that it kind of bridges the distance between 5e and sort of World of Darkness and the OSR movement so that people <coughs> can sort of naturally be brought along. You know, because that... You know, first of all, um, you know, as Willie Sutton said when asked, uh, why do you rob banks? And he said, well, that's where the money is. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so people ask me, why are you doing a D uh, D20 system, Mark? Why are you doing 5E? Well, I mean, right now, that's where the gamers are, right? Yeah. Um, like the vast numbers. and But I think that just like in the 90s, a lot of D&D &D players are a little bored, they want something else, and they see a different style of play online. And it's a style of play that, that is um, both simpler and more dangerous. And 5e is not dangerous. It is it is designed so that you never, ever have to worry about dying. But that means there's no drama. There's no there's no sense of peril, you know? And and that's, uh, that's unfortunate, because peril and danger is hugely important in drama right i mean i mean look at any great superhero movie or or action movie there's always a clock there's a countdown there's something that makes you feel like you're running out of time and ideally that is health and and death and so that's why um you know we have a blight uh meter on badlander all of our uh tail spinner games will have a blight meter which basically means that when your blight starts at zero, but when it gets to over 10, when you get above 10, you're no longer a player character. You're out. And so that's a basic meter that you cannot screw with. And the more blight you have, the more screwed up. It's like corruption in Warhammer, right? It's the, you're more screwed up and it's like, or humanity and vampire. Um, the more blight you have, the more screwed up you have psychologically or, or physically. And you're out. And then hit points is uh, it's just much more dangerous. Um, you don't get any hit points after uh, well, we have ranks, but after rank ten, you're done with hit points. That's it. That's the max. So, um, so, so it makes it much, much more dangerous at higher levels. It's, oh, it's yeah. really, really scary, and that's one huge problem with both Pathfinder and Five E is that no one plays above like ninth level because the game is broken. It's it's yeah. simple broken i i said that yesterday uh somebody was talking about how oh wouldn't it be cool to have all these feats and all this other stuff in fifth edition i'm like dude i've been playing pathfinder first edition for years okay you want to talk about feats we have feats for years the only problem is is because all the really cool ones are gated behind really high levels or really high ability scores or really high um base attack bonuses and everything like that, you'll never see them because the average game only lasts like, you know, five or six sessions or, uh, you know, you never really get past six level. Yeah. So, and then know. it breaks down and everyone's like, oh, you know, and it's not like this purposeful thing, you know, but people sort of go, ah, yeah, yeah. and they get, they're basically getting bored because the system's kind of broken. There's no drama and there's no tension. Um, and they, they 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 stop, and then and then they come come back and they go, oh, let's start again. Yeah, let's do new characters, and it's because new characters are more interesting. Like yes. first level characters, there's actually some de tension and, and danger there because you can die. You know, <laughs> hey, Graham, you're back. The heat okay, yeah. the computer, I bet. <laughs> I, I think he had a power outage over there because the oh UK is probably yeah, okay, sweltering. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's really, um, and, and obviously, you know, we're not going to get it right the first time out. And I think that's one thing that a lot of game designers 
don't admit is that you know unless you have enormous resources like like the the five e crew did when they made five e where they could just do this you know big data uh, crunching of the numbers uh, and then figure out like the perfect d and d for everyone right um, you know but 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 most games aren't we can't afford that you know and so we have to sort of you know go through additions so obviously we're going to be feeling our way through this um but I, I think this addition, like we spent just an enormous amount of time trying to figure it out. And I think there's some really, truly innovative ideas in it. For instance, the the crux rules, which are basically morale. Um, you have a giant D6 on each side. And yeah. you start with, with it with at zero. And then as it goes up, if it gets up to six, you're able to basically force them to make a morale roll to see if they'd run away or not. And so every time you get a, a critical hit, you can get, add a crux dice. Every time you get a critical fail, you got to take away a point. Uh, and so you have actually see these meters, these giant dice on the table, and you can see them going up and down, and it adds a lot of tension, and it means that you know the enemy actually runs away sometimes. It means you will run away sometimes, <laughs> which is, like, really true to life. You know, uh, Jason has also been to New Guinea, and if you've ever seen a, a battle in New Guinea, uh, it mostly involves people running away. You know, it's running up, running back, running up, running back. That's, you know, kind of, I think that's probably the, what war looked like for, you know, most of history. (laughs) Uh, Medical battles are certainly described that way. Charges and retreats, charges and retreats. And so we're trying to capture that in these rules. Well, and people don't, you know, we talked about this last week on the show. Mm -hmm. Um, People, most people don't want to get, completely bogged down in a combat that like you know that you get together for a three four hour session most people don't want two hours of that to be rolling dice and 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 trading hits there are some people that that's that's what they enjoy but most gamers by you know even when interviewed they don't want combat to get drugged down to the point that it's lost all meaning um and so part of the part of the advantage of the crux die is that it creates a momentum and once your team has some momentum going, you can, you know, the other side can tell that and and will surrender, run away. Um, and you still you still have the victory. You have all the joy of the victory, but you aren't bogged down in people. <laughs> Again, normal creatures, you know, whether whether human or goblin or whatever, theoretically aren't suicidal and, and shouldn't fight to the death. Um, mm-hmm. At some point, they're going to say, you know what, I've got a wife and kids or whatever, um, or I want to live to fight another day. And I do, and I do like the crux die uh, system. I like what we've come up with that because it, it, it kind of brings a level of realism to, a, you know, there's a there's there's that morale and momentum that kicks in. So I think it's a good system. I think people will like it. And it adds a lot of tension because as as you know, their die goes up and your die goes down, or vice versa. It's sort of you can visually see with these giant d6 sort of the the, the way the battle was going. And then also just lets us uh, have a lot of different powers um, affect the crux dice. So it kind of means that, you know, you can try to win the battle through the morale system and, and it creates sort of a, a dynamic tension there that, 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 you know, simplifies combat because it makes it quicker. Right. But mm-hmm. it also uh, it, it provides another avenue for the, for the conflict to take place in. So it's not just, who has the most hit points left, you know, which actually, is, which is sort of a static way to do things. Yeah. I was actually going to ask you about that. Um, one of the things I, I used to like about vampire was the fact that, uh, well, I still like about it is, um, it has wound levels. And after a certain point, you know, you, you take too many wounds and you start getting minuses and you start going into what I call the death spiral, which is, you know, you, your, your roles, are so heavily penalized that you can't succeed to the point where it's kind of like you're going to die if you continue to fight. Um, but uh, I always thought that was a lot uh, a better way of doing things than hit points because you know the the traditional hit point method is just kind of like yeah I'm 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 operating at 100 percent until I hit zero hit points right which is just kind of like ridiculous because I. I fought in the SCA. I fought in martial arts matches and things like that. And it's kind of like, you know, getting kicked in the leg a few times like that is, is going to change how you operate. 
Yeah, or... yeah, yeah. Which is why I actually we had considered, uh, you know, going towards a uh, system where the the game master makes no rolls at all. And in fact, I still am thinking for the next game we'll we'll switch over to this. But I, I love that system where the player makes a defense roll, right? And then they so they're basically rolling the attacks against them, except that they want to roll high to prevent it from hitting them. Right. And then that way your AC adds to your roll and you want to stop them. And then the difficulty is based on how powerful the monster is, right? Mm -hmm. um, or the, your opponent. And then that way the game the players are all making the rolls. And then that way it's easier to have a system where they can their armor actually subtracts from the damage. And so your armor works more naturally and it has and it makes it feel much more immediate and, and real. Um, like like a real combat. But we decided not to do that because um, that is the number one thing that people don't like about like Powered by the Apocalypse and all these other games. You know, they, they get confused. Like, why is why are, why am I rolling for the enemy? The game has to rule for the enemy, and it's like one of these things that uh, people fun. Some people, not all, have a fundamental disconnect with. They just don't get it. Um, but but I, I think we've got we've we've worked our own workarounds for that anyway. But uh, but yeah, it's a, it's funny with game design. There's a whole delicate balancing mechanism, like how how far do you take things towards innovation, and how much do you keep things the same to make things. Uh, um, you know, um, work for the maximum number of people. And that's important, not just for me as a game designer and us as a game company, but for every tail spinner, which is our word for game designer, you're trying to entertain a table full of people, right? Like mm -hmm. you have a variety of people. Each player has different goals and different things they want and different sort of, you know, uh, ways they think about rules and ways they think about their character and so you got to find a way to make them all happy and, and so game rules are very unique in that way and that and that they sort of got to give something to everyone you know with a board game you can just target a very specific kind of player and people will try out the board game and either they like it or they don't and if they don't they don't play it again but with a role-playing game you know if you have one player who doesn't like the rules well then you're not using that system Either that, or you got to get a new friend. <laughs> and so, and so, role playing games are very tricky that way because you've got to make it so that that you can ha uh, help a game master appeal to everyone at the table. It's it, it's, yeah. it's hard. I agree. Um, there's been several times I've tried to implement rules, and the players are just like, and someone's kind of like, okay, well, maybe we can. <laughs> Maybe we can get rid of that rule, or maybe we can work around it to where it feels better. Yeah, yeah. Like like players, if you try to nerf their powers or or make it easier to die, they're gonna have a mutiny, right? Because they're like really mad at you that you're trying to kill off their characters, but they don't understand that they're actually gonna have a much better time, right? Because because they're gonna actually feel tension and drama, and they're gonna actually be in the story, and they're gonna be scared for their lives, and that is good. They don't, you know, but they don't think that's good. They think you're trying to hurt them, right? So they get mad at you. So you the gotta sneak these yeah. things in. You gotta do them without being obvious that you're doing it, so that they don't have a mutiny and they don't protest, and so that they and so they will have more fun. It's an amazing psychological dance in a way that both game designers and game masters sort of have to do. The games we remember are the ones where we overcome great adversity, but we don't like it in the moment. But afterwards, those are the games we talk about. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's almost, I think, why 5E is has so many people who sort of play very superficially up to like fifth level and they don't sort of continue and they play play every once in a while with their, you know, it's not as an intense a hobby for many people as it was for a lot of us when we were younger, you know, when when the rules were harder and, and less forgiving and there was more death, you know, like with 5e death is just so incredibly rare that I think it's just not as an intense experience for a lot of people. And I think the old school renaissance and a lot of these other games that are trying to bring that back like um uh, nave or um you know or mork bork or all these are trying to bring back that feeling of of you know really hardcore um like you can die right mm -hmm. uh, uh, not just simplicity but of fear 
And uh, I, I think that's a, that's a key thing that, that role playing in general, we need to move that back towards there. And we need to make players realize that that you will have more fun if you die occasionally. Yeah, I. Um... Oh man, <laughs> I'm still, I'm still kind of like, uh, kind of blown away by a lot of this. Um... It's like drinking from a fire hose, isn't it? Mark has a. It kind of is, yeah. <laughs> point market point market again discussion and he'll go yeah um i do agree that a lot of the uh a lot of the players uh, even my fellow players and stuff like that really are are not fond of you know the the whole death mechanics and stuff and you know a lot of times we get uh you know some of us old grognards we get a little pissy with uh you know fifth edition players because we're just kind of oh, you're, you're just doing a story game you know why have a game if you're just going to tell a story and all that but then i have to kind of remember and go back and point out it's like well you know vampire was a storytelling game too but uh but we had mechanics for that too and plenty of people were more than happy to you know flaunt their disciplines whenever they had a chance and uh and speaking of that okay we had a question from way earlier and i'm actually curious about this myself but what is your favorite clan Oh, oh I, you know, know. I have many children, but I couldn't possibly have a favorite. <laughs> That's a fair one. I was always a Nosferatu fan myself because it's kind of like, okay, well, we can't do anything socially, so we have to work harder and smarter than everybody else to go behind the scenes. But uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, for me, it's like, uh, like every clan, especially the, the the core ones, the core seven. You know, they were each specifically designed to to reflect an aspect of me of what I love to do and how I like to play. And so, you know, I, I really believe that artists should create for themselves first and foremost, because you can't really predict what other people will like, but you're, you can always predict very accurately what you like. And so if you like it, there's a good chance some other people will. And so you just got to, you know, have a very diverse and wide perspective on the world and on what you like, and then if it's broad enough and wide enough, if you just pursue these different avenues, you're going to hit, hopefully, a lot of different types of people. And, and obviously, in the case of Vampire and the different clans, um, that worked, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Like, like they all, each of them has their own niche and appeal to a certain very unique segment of people. And, um, you know, and they're fanatical about it. Like, you know, people are you know, tend to play, oh, I'm a, I tend to play fighters. I play magic users. I play bards. Right. But with clans, you could, people are really hardcore. Right. Uh, so I feel like on that, I, I succeeded big time and, and hopefully it'll be similar with Badlander and our guilds, which is our, you know, kind of our clans and our, or classes and our uh, birthrights, which are, which is our sort of races. Then hopefully those are unique enough and powerful enough and cultural enough, so they're not just you know this is your job, but they're re you know have a reality to them that that people will, um, will love them. You know that 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 was how we wrote them. That's for sure. Well, I I think part of what made vampires so different and unique was the fact that you had clans, you had factions right. built right into the game. And that continued through all the the White Wolf products, um, and that was something that was really cool. Was the fact that you had you had built in conflict right from the very get go, um, even though, you know, back you know I'd say back in the early day, you know, alignment was kind of your source of conflict, but it wasn't really a conflict if everybody had the same alignment. But with Vampire, at least, you know, everybody had. A different you would have a different clan, so you'd have Nosferatu and you'd have you know, um, Tr uh, Toriador, and they didn't necessarily get along. And you had Tremere because nobody liked them and nobody trusted them. Ben, yeah, Trude, who it, were always it, trying it to brought, run it brought the politics into the gaming group, and because of your clan, it brought the politics of life in your character as well. Mm -hmm. So, you, you would just by the nature of your clan, you will have. You know um a certain um outlook and a position in, in the world you know yeah and i i love that element about it it's it it's just even the character creation 
kind of was already like the start of the story, as it were. Uh, and that is something that's kind of maybe a little bit lacking in a lot of the the newer, well, in, in all of the, the Dungeons and Dragons type games. It's kind of like, you know, people will roll up backgrounds and things like that, but it's really not a substitute for it, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, it's like, yeah. And, and, and the backgrounds are so specific that mm-hmm. they don't give you this, this social group, right? Which is why I'm actually very proud, sorry to push on Badlander again, but I'm oh, no. with it. That we have uh we have for our backgrounds character, you first choose which estate you're a part of. And of course, um, very famously in medieval times, there are said to be four estates. There's those who rule, those who pray, those who work, and then there was a fourth added later, those who sell, the, the, the merchants, right? And so we have 10 estates. We have all the way from royalty to vile born. And each of them have to wear a different badge. And, and you actually are, you know, segregated by your estate. It's like literally like a caste system, like in, um, like in uh, India um, used to have. And uh, people are like, why would you want such rigid caste? That makes it boring. I'm like, no, uh, the more you can find and restrict a character, the more fun they are to play. This is a truism of all storytelling. And uh, if you restrict a character, if you, you make it hard for them, it's going to be easier. So if you have a character who's royal born, sure, they can go to any castle and be welcome and you know be treated like royalty because, well, they are royalty. But if they try to go out and hang out with the outlaws or the vile born or the, or the outcasts, they're not going to fit in at all. They're going to be completely out of place and perhaps even in danger. And so that means that you want in your group a variety of different estates. And then once you pick your estate, then you pick the specific background. And each estate has three backgrounds that we start with. And then, of course, we'll be adding lots more later. And because I'm a Renaissance history and medieval history junkie, uh, <laughs> who's been collecting this stuff for years, and, of course, I had Ars Magica where I did some of this, you know, these backgrounds are going to be really, really flavorful. They are really flavorful. And I think it's going to be a, a huge amount to the, the game. And we're unapologetically restricting players. You know, we're, we're kind of slotting you in and instantly you have your politics, you know. So your estate gives you instantly politics. Your character class, what we call guild, that's politics. Like you are in a guild, an actual guild. And these guilds fight each other and conflict with each other. And they're all vying for power. And, and so they have actual, you know, um, that's politics. And, of course, the birthrights, we have basically two categories. The metal-born, who've been on Lorne for thousands of years, and they're met, their skin has actually turned metallic. And then we have the pure-born, or basically the more, uh, you know, our human archetype. And they consider themselves pure and undulterated by the world. And, and they consider themselves better. So, you know, we have racism. But it's the, hopefully the kind of races that people will not find personally um, hurtful because it's not based on our races. It's based on you know their races, on a metal glint to your skin or not. And so, so that way you can tell these stories um, that are very real and true. You know, racism is a it's part of history. It's not just a modern uh, Western thing, right? Um, right. You know, look at the Chinese. Look at the, the Japanese. They have long histories of extreme xenophobia, mm-hmm. uh, like like uh, horrifying amounts. Um, not, uh, look at Europe. Look at look at ancient the Middle East. You know this, this stuff is very human. And if you're going to tell real stories and powerful stories, you want to have an element of this. Now, of course, a game master can just ignore that. Like if you don't want to deal with it, just ignore it. Of course, of course, of course. But if as a game master, if I just fail to include that, it's going to feel like it's a paper down. and and uh it's not gonna feel like a real world it's it's certainly not gonna feel grim dark or or hard fantasy you know which is what my preference is and and of course you can play our any of my games is high fantasy people used to play vampire superhero right that was designed into the system just like high fantasy designed into this as well but the, the, the sort of the standard c- assumption is there's a little bit of grit, a little bit of hard, there's a little bit of real, and, and you want at least some of that because 
in my mind, that's where storytelling comes out of. You know, you, it's hard to have stories where players can have anything they want, anytime they want, anything can happen at any time. You know, it's hard to have a good story in the world like that. Yeah, <clears throat> I agree. It's uh, the more elements that you can that you can add to the game that uh, kind of draw upon realistic or real life uh, issues and things like that seem to be kind of what people are doing these days. But um, they're kind of doing it in a more heavy handed way that I, I don't find really palatable. I mean, it's like I. Until I had got to Twitter, you know, I guess we had pretty much like lived in a vacuum in our own little uh, role playing game community because it was kind of like I had never heard of people equating, you know, uh, orcs with black people. And that was just like that was disgusting the first time I heard about it. It still disgusts me to this day because it's, it's such a stupid Absolutely. thing. Yeah, I think that's actually why um, in Lord of the Rings he made orcs like an invented species mm -hmm. to sort of avoid any of that connotation and i think in the early days of dnd there was you know there is that sort of colonial idea of let's kill off the savages you know and you know that, that there's a there's a whole it's it's tricky like you know and, and and of course once you start making the game about a moral cause and you want everything in the game to be moral then it's it's hard then you got to do everything right then you got to look at stuff like that and what we do is we simply say that anything that has a moat, uh, a moat is your soul, uh, and, and Lorne is, is what, what's called an Everborn. You're considered a human, right? And, and all the laws about if someone has a moat, they're human. Now, some beasts, most beasts and monsters and creatures have shards, which are splinters of a moat. Like you've been when you get sharded, when you lose, you get so much blight that you're when you're not reborn again as a moat, but you're reborn as these shards split up all over the place. And so, in a way, it's a mercy to kill a monster um, or or break a, an intelligent sword that has a shard in it, because then you let that shard have a chance to reunite with its other shards and become a moat again. And so, you're almost doing a mercy to these beasts by by killing them because you're releasing the shard. And so, you know, these beasts aren't fully intelligent. They can only talk a little bit. They're, they're shards. And so, therefore, you, you know, there's a whole... By, by having this setting have this whole, you know, reincarnation metaphor with these modes, I mean, it's all fully worked out. And it's, it's kind of beautiful, I think. I think we kind of get around a lot of these problems um, that other games have, you know, where, where they still sort of posit um, creatures as being... Um, tribal you know and as someone who's lived with tribal people uh in various countries around the world from the amazon to you know the hill tribes in, in thailand where i spent a lot of time you know for me it's like i like i think tribal people are super cool and fully human and you know mm -hmm. <laughs> not to be like slaughtered <laughs> but there is a long history of treating tribal people as non-human right mm -hmm. that is standard and that's not just in the west like even in thailand you have people talking about oh they're just hill tribes who cares you know they don't they don't vote we can do whatever we want and you know um loggers will come in and just wipe out their forest that they rely on you know and and so um i don't know it's it's very very tricky i think we found a way around it i think you know um but but you know you can't be too ethically minded while playing a game because then you're not going to have any fun you know and and, and pl players should be allowed to play bad people that's part of the fun that's part of the interesting thing and you know i love storytelling with characters who are evil or or partly evil or just bad or corrupted or you know that's completely valid way to play you know so um it's just that as a game designer you want to avoid uh encouraging people to do you know to pretend to think their characters are good but then they're doing really really evil things you know which mm -hmm. is how a lot of games kind of work let's face it right like you can play a lawful good character and do these horrible horrible things like that's in fact the the classic trope of the paladin right the, the player playing the lawful good paladin who is actually doing horrible things um and which i think is actually interesting and wonderful but 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 
we, we should maybe miss maybe lawful good isn't quite as good or lawful as, as <laughs> they pretend to be, right? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was about to say, uh, there tends to be a, uh, a tendency in modern, especially modern fantasy role-playing games, 5th edition in particular, where character creation is kind of devolved into a group of people standing around in a uh, in a costume wardrobe and everyone's just kind of picking out what costume their character is going to wear and you might mm -hmm. have a party of a tiefling yeah. elf dwarf and a and a halfling and they're all headed towards the dungeon you know there, there's no it's all just kind of a disney world feel to it where everyone is uh just a reskinned version of almost a human being whereas i, I feel like in what you've described with lost your lost Warren and your Warren campaign setting there is that uh character creation should uh inform the direction of the adventure you know with uh, some of the estates i'm looking at the badland uh badlanders document right here by choosing an estate and having someone with a specific estate in the group then um the referee or the the game master will be able to create content based on that the character creation is going to offer a guideline or a roadmap for where the adventure should go and the directions it can take rather than having just four differently colored people all going to the dungeon uh, you know <laughs> yeah I mean? yeah i mean i mean my, my philosophy of game design is ideally character creation should be the the campaign the saga creation at the same time like like the choices the players make could help you as the tail spinner, the game master, uh, create your entire saga, your entire campaign. So, so those estates, those those choices, those politics that you're mixed up in, that each character is mixed up in, those help you create an endless series of stories that directly involve the character. They aren't things that happen to the character. They are stories from the character and from who and what they are from their past. And, and that's the that is the gold standard for game design. When that, when that happens, I believe you designed a great game. That can yeah. that can be a whole lot of no fun uh, as well, though. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, I've had so many problems yeah. getting the computer back up. No, you're fine. Um, you know, if if you're a games master who's coming to a game with a strong story idea of you, of your own, and then the players are all pitching in and all expect everything to be. Uh, to be done according to the background that they've chosen and yeah the kind of people that give you you know 30 page novellas of character oh, yeah. background you know that can be oh no that no can you, get to you, be a bit you don't much. want that you don't you, i i i <coughs> discourage people from doing that um um it should be from the character creation and it should be very simple archetypes and mm. and you should work them into what you have and the, the world and and uh mm. yeah you can't let them simply write up an essay and dictate to you what happens that's never going to work <laughs> uh, um so what you do instead is though that that if they're you know let's say they're an outcast so they're a, a beggar on the street then they have a whole sort of history and when you make a passion role we have these seven passions you know um perhaps um you know one of them is tied into their life in the streets and their 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 feeling of uh, of being less valuable and worthwhile, and and the, the and the sort of the way they um, are have contempt for the character in the group who is highborn, um, you know, it, it stems from their feelings of inadequacy, and so you're able to work in a, a whole interpersonal relationship there, and then you can touch upon that as you go through your story. It doesn't dictate the story, but it, it becomes something you can you can do a callbacks to. And, and as anyone who's worked in the sitcoms or understands sitcoms or, or TV writing, callbacks are the key to, to this, that kind of storytelling, right? The episodic storytelling, you want callbacks. So, like, for instance, if at the top of a comedy uh, half hour, you have a, uh, you mention a joke, by the last end of the story, you want to call back to that joke. And in, and in, and in other kinds of episodic dramatic stories, you want these callbacks to be, you know, a, a a fairly common thing to, to bring these characters to life and make them feel like part of the world. But a mm -hmm. callback does not mean the character is dictating your story or setting. Yeah. Oh, no. 
No, because there is a there is a lot of that in modern game design. The the like spend a token to interfere with the GM's plot and screw it up. You know? Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I I don't agree with that at all. Like 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 we have drama stones, but they don't just let you completely screw with the plot. And and even if the player tries, the you know the the tail spinner can just reject it because because in the end that that's why you have a uh, you know a dictator at the table <laughs> or the dictator can do what dictators do best which is you know um establish rea reality establish order and make the trains run on time <laughs> and uh you know we agree to have this dictator at our table because we want that we want to have this curated experience and yeah. you know there's, there's a happy medium to be found there somewhere. I mean, there's always been bad DMs in Dungeons & Dragons who view it adversarially um, or who railroad characters. And during the heights of the storyteller system, there were a lot of frustrated novelists who were, who were storytellers who were, you basically had to jump through their hoops. But there, there's got to be something in between. And it sounds like that's where, that's where you're aiming. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. And, and once again, it's a very delicate balance, right? Like, you know, like, and, and you have to sort of feel your way through it. And, um, and I, I hope we get it right. If we didn't, we're going to fix it. Um, okay. Well, real quick, I wanted to ask, uh, Jason, if you, if you have a link where people can pick up Badlanders, because I'm having a hard time finding it. <laughs> uh, yeah, let me... <laughs> Let me let me let me get on that. Let me get that link. All right, because I I definitely want to support everything that you're working on. Um, well, and Kickstarter starts literally in one hour. We're going to do the countdown live on this show, and the Kickstarter will begin. And uh, the great news is, by the way, that that the way we do Kickstarters is that we have the book not only completely written, but Kickstarter the Badlander is already laid out and completely done. It's it's done. So basically, as soon as the money comes through from the Kickstarter, we'll be sending out the PDFs. And uh, literally, the Kickstarter, the, 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 the proofs of the game are already at the printer. So basically, we already have a slot at the printer. Uh, and the, pr the printing will start basically before the end of the Kickstarter. So people, what we're hoping to do is by sort of foregoing... You know, all these T-shirts and dice, all these extra things that you get from China. We're trying to vastly <laughs> shorten the window amount of time that people have to wait. So you get less physical rewards, but we get more, many, many more digital rewards. And you get your stuff right away. Like you get the PDF instantly, basically. And then you get the book as, as soon as humanly possible. So no waiting for a year or two years or even months, uh, um, <laughs> you should be able to get the Badlander like fast. Yeah, I, you I've, know, I've learned my lesson. That's how I'm going to do it in future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the only way to go. And and we're we're basically hope uh, it's our whole fast iteration philosophy, and that's why we have all these different books all being written, all being laid out right now, so we can do one Kickstarter quarter and be like like be like a you know a clock. Uh, every book will be 288 pages, full color, hardback. And then eventually we hope to go to um, once every two months and eventually once a month. And then that'll be it. We can't go faster than that. <laughs> but that's basically <coughs> how we did it at White Wolf. My philosophy at White Wolf, my strategy was, you know, we've got to fill up the, the marketing sales channels. Every month, distributors used to have a magazine that went out to their stores and our goal was to always have a new product in, every, in that magazine every month. And so initially at White Wolf, we had a new book out every single month. And um, Nathan in chat had a valid question. Like, will yeah. we need the fifth edition core rulebook or is everything? Oh, no, no. This, everything is everything. Is in, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's essentially its own game. Um, um, it really isn't that. It, if, you, if you love 5e... You will find a lot of it familiar, but really, it's its own game called Tailspin or D twenty. And so, essentially, if you like Vampire or the World of Darkness, the Storyteller System, it's Storyteller System with the D twenty. Is nice. basically how I can explain it. 
I did and, want to point and, out that there is a uh, Badlander quick start bundle, which includes the character sheet and a, uh, a sizable preview PDF on Drive Through RPG. Uh, looks like he put that up last month, and I just put I put the link for that in the chat. So if you want to take a get a good preview of it and take a look at the rules and the character sheet, that that's available right now. Uh, Greg, you might have to post it in the private chat. Okay. I don't think it's displaying it. And I can I can post it up on the main. Yeah, there it is. What? Well, while there's a room to get in a word edgewise, Mark. Um, <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. This is wonderful. I mean, as 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 uh, Kringay pointed out, uh, um, you you answer questions before they're even asked. Um, do you want to give a a two sentence, three sentence description of what Badlander is? What it what what are Badlanders? Oh uh, yeah, but so so one thing I sort of object to in um in uh, sort of D and D is that the idea of an adventurer doesn't feel real to me as a cultural thing, right? Um, like it, it has a sort of a, a it's a fantasy trope, definitely, but but like in history and in real world, were there ever actually people call adventurers? Well, there were mercenaries. You know, so if someone's a mercenary, they should be a mercenary, which is why our guild of sort of fighter types is called Freeblades, and they are mercenaries and bodyguards, and they're literally, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting over COVID. No, no problem. Um, and so, you know, they are mercenaries, and other guilds are different types of professions along that line, but Badlanders basically are um, the, the special forces of the kingdom for which they live in and work for. And they've sworn an oath, a personal oath of loyalty to the crown, to the, the royal family. And so they are, when they're at home, they're bodyguards to the royal family, the same way, let's say, the musketeers or the bodyguards of the royal family. Uh, and the star guard, their mortal enemies who wear purple tunics and the, the Badlanders wear the, the black and silver, uh, they serve the state and the wazir and the bureaucracy and uh, uh, um, um, and everything else. So um, um, so basically then they go out on missions uh, for the crown and so they're the, they're the explorers, the, the frontiers people uh, who are, are sort of, you know, uh, going to places where there aren't lords and then they are judge and jury. So they literally, parts of the adventures are, you are literally doing, uh, running courts. So in, in frontier places that don't have their own lord, um, you know, people will save up their, their their problems and disputes, and the battles will come in and serve as one will serve as the judge, two others will serve as lawyers, and you'll you'll sort of try to come up with a solution that makes people happy. But you basically represent the crown in these in these areas. So when you're at home, you're part of court politics, and when you're out, you're basically you're representing the crown. So you actually have a role. You have an important thing that you do in the world that is a, a real thing. Missions that matter. I'm uh, yeah, I'm working on punching up some stuff here for the chat to enjoy. Let's see. And Mark, do you yeah. want to? As long as we got this other rake, do you want to describe? You mentioned the tree in the tempest. Is there anything else about the world of Lost Lorn you want to? Oh, uh, a question was asked earlier about passions. I mean, I'd look. We should. We should say a little bit about the world of Lost Lorn as well. Um, passions, how would you describe passions, Mark? Uh, passions have been described as alignments, but they're not quite that. Um, but but you have seven pairs of passions. As you see, it's honor and oathless, courage and gutless, so they have one score. So, for instance, if you could have an honor of five, and then suddenly something horrible happens to you, and you're on, and it flips, and suddenly you have an oathless of five. Because in, the, in, the, in real life people, you can see this in storytelling at least. I don't know if it's in the real world. I think it's the real world. But in storytelling, you can definitely see, you know, someone, does, <clears throat> someone doesn't go from honor of five and then suddenly to a one oathless. No. What's dramatic is you go from a five honor to a five oathless, you know, and you, mm -hmm. you sort of flip sides in a way. And so you have one pair of these that is your crux pair. That's where it's a high or low on both at the same time. So, for instance, you might have your crux pair be faithless and loyal, 
and that means that you are um, both faithless and loyal, and it sort of depends on the situation which you are. And then once that gets resolved, then you have to pick another pair to be your next crux pair. So I, I think it's a very elegant, beautiful system, and these are used a lot in like saving throw type circumstances. And uh, whichever way you roll, uh, if you if you start role playing that out uh, in full and doing a great job role playing out that passion that you just rolled either high or the anti one if you roll low, um, that can get you drama stones, which are basically like. Um, um, bonus stones you can use to redo rolls or, or, or try things you couldn't normally do. Um, they're held in common by the table. Um, so, so, the whole, so it's, it's unlike just you do, unlike Dean 5e where you have one basically bonus point. Inspiration I think it's called. Um, you can have a, a, up, to f up to five or six I believe, but the, the table holds them in common and any player can use them at any time. So uh, it makes it more of a communal thing so so role playing out these passions is, is a key part of the game and and i find that's really important because one thing role playing games tend to not do well in is that players don't role play out emotion right i've always found that to be a weird thing that is lacking in role playing games including my own i'm not i'm not saying that my <laughs> games are any better at it as they haven't been um and I, so this is my attempt at sort of encouraging players to actually play out um, negative and positive emotions in a way that, that adds a little pathos and high drama. And we're kind of going for a Shakespeare feel to this, sort of a, a Elizabethan, you know, raucous, um, you know, um, you know uh, very passionate, very overwrought feel. And so the characters sort of having these raw emotions is really adds a lot to the game i think and um, hopefully it'll work as well for everyone else as it did for my playtesting because we had some truly fantastic times with histrionic characters making speeches and being incredibly passionate um so uh i, I think it, it could be fantastic nathan I I was gonna say Nathan. Nathan asks that question: uh, uh, Do they affect things like combat? Any? Yeah, any ab ab absolutely. So if someone uh, um, wants to spend their action making a passion roll, that can give them and everyone else bonuses and affect the crux dice, thus the morale. So you go, you know, if you could spend your action like making a speech, we must do this. My loved one is in that castle, and if we fail, she will die. And then you know you roll that. And if you get it, then everyone's gonna bonus on the rolls that turn. And and and, oh, and you get uh, you can go up one on the crux dice, which means the enemy might run away just from your speech. Um, so so Nate, these things are can be integrated very naturally and organically by the game master. But we also, of course, have specific rules for those who need rules. <laughs> Nathan is smart enough to recognize your pin tag in the background, Mark. Nathan's Nathan. smart enough to what? He recognizes your pin dragon background. Oh, uh, okay. Hey, Pendragon's good stuff, though. Oh, Mark loves <laughs> it. Yeah. And here I'm, I'm going through the, the character creation stuff, and it's, you have jonglures! <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. You can actually play jesters. That's actually kind of cool. Um, well, I already know what I'm going with the garlic eater when I get to try this game. <laughs> there you go. I yeah. am so in love with the garlic eater. That is my favorite thing, and it's, it's something I had in my back pocket. I actually wanted to use it in Ars Magica, and Jonathan was like, "Garlic eater, that makes no sense." And I'm like, "Well, you it's know, the I, best I have, name ever for." I have Italian ancestry, so it speaks to me. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and, I, and I always it's it's just so funny to me because I love garlic, and I just feel like it's funny whenever I go to a country and the elite always look down on the low class people as, "Oh, they eat garlic. They eat too much garlic. They smell." And I'm like, uh, "Uh oh." <laughs> Because I must smell like garlic a lot. Because I love garlic. I put garlic. I can't in trust everything. somebody who doesn't like garlic. There's a yeah. there's actually a famous historical story where um, a group of French knights actually offended a uh, a uh, Arab uh, a Middle Eastern potentate with uh, their breath because it stank of garlic so badly. <laughs> I, I read it in one of the. Uh, Islamic texts, but yeah, yeah, and I must admit, if you don't eat garlic, garlic breath does smell. But you know, there's a very <laughs> simple solution: eat garlic too. <laughs> yeah. 
I saw spinster. That has unfortunate associations in Britain. <laughs> uh, what's this, what's the what's the uh, so, connotations in Britain? So or, like, in in, Br in Britain, if you call someone a spinster, it means they're you know old and unmarried. Yeah, and, that's, it's the same in America too. But we're uh, we're la literally trying to take back the term. Because originally, <laughs> spinster meant someone who's literally spinning thread on a on a on a, 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 a spindle. Yeah, that, that's and, how it and got so associated. We're, we're, we're taking back the term so that, because I, I think it's unfortunate that it has that connotation. So in this game, we, we've taken it back. And essentially, spinsters <laughs> are our magic users. They're, you do do magic, we, although magic is a word we never, ever, ever use. use. So, yeah, we're so never it's, it's, a, it's one of the banned words. So they, they, <laughs> they basically do uncanny through telling stories. And so by yeah. telling stories, so Spencers are storytellers who do uncanny through their stories, which I think is a very beautiful metaphor for those yeah. of us who do storytelling as our hobby, right? That, um, that's how it got its association here, though, is because all the older women uh, would take to spinning um, to get get in the money to be to be able to live. Though yeah, there yeah, is a, yeah. I mean, it, there it, is another. Sorry, there's there's another side to it though. There's a church near us where they put up what's called maidens' garlands, and those are to celebrate old women that died as virgins. So they hang those up in the Christian church. So spinster is a, a two-edged sword, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I I love the term, and I'm very proud of taking it back because I, I think it's uh, I think anything that makes fun of old women or old men is just sort of unfortunate, you know. <laughs> Like, like yeah, I've always, they're... I've always revered older people as being, uh, you know, um, as having sort of a, I think life experience is really valuable. And it's, I'm always amazed by younger people, you know, like I'm going, wait a minute, this person's only 20 and they, just, they are so smart and <laughs> erudite and amazing. And, and so I'm not saying anything against young people because I'm always amazed by just how with it young people have and how like they seem to know as much as I do about a lot of stuff, but older people definitely have, there's definitely some about brutal life experience. You know, that's really <laughs> valuable, right? It's pain. Yeah. It's just the, lots the old, and lots of pain and it the, makes the, you wiser. And, uh, <laughs> and so I, 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 I like, I would, I'm very proud of taking away at least one really negative trope that I don't like. Yeah. The, the older I get, the older my characters get. <laughs> <laughs> it's <really> funny that. <laughs> yeah, I have a hard time playing a really young character. I must admit, because I have to play them as, uh, yeah, yeah, as, as dumb as I was in my twenties. Oh my gosh, Which we got is... so many new people here in the chat. We got Alicia Lee. We got girl from Vault eighty eight. Hey, nice to see you. And of course, Gray Sentinel. Um, yeah, Alicia right. is on our team. Oh, is it okay? Great, that's cool. Uh, something I have like to ask. Subscribe about. by our merch. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely like and subscribe. We're we're, we're fighting so hard to get to a thousand, but yeah. um, but all right, I gotta ask. Uh, I noticed that you have uh, your your weapon systems and stuff, and uh, a lot of the the damages and stuff are familiar to me with you know the kind of normal uh, you know OSR type weaponry. My my always my biggest concern when I get a new role playing game of any kind is. That people are not going to want to role play so much as they will look and they'll say, they'll look at the thing and say, "Oh, look, okay, so these guys start off with a two die six weapon right away. That's I want the biggest weapon I can possibly use and then crush people to death with or kill people as fast as possible because they're they're too busy, you know, thinking of how to how to power game their character." Uh, Whereas you got this other character here who starts off with a whip, which is a D4, which is kind of like people are going to go, oh, no, that's, nobody's going to pick this. Yeah, yeah, and until they realize that um, that that when you take a weapon that uses finesse as the skill, um, that, that gives you all these special options for how you use it that can do incredibly cool, interesting things. So we found a way to make it so that um, hit points is only one aspect of how you can do it. So, for instance... With your whip, if you have finesse, you can actually do these amazing, cool-looking things with your whip, like snatch a gun out of or a weapon out of the leader's hands, which not only takes away the, the weapon of their of their principal bad guy, but it's going to give you crux points and help you win the combat just through morale. Ah. So, so once people understand the game, they realize these hit points is only one dimension of success in combat. 
that. I like that idea because uh, <laughs> I, I feel like too often, you know, people are, are just looking to min max without uh, regard to role play. Yeah. And, then, and, the, and the thing is that um, that's made too easy to do by a, a poor game design, which only has one dimension to conflict. And the key way to avoid that is to add dimensions. And so in Vampire, of course, we had humanity, which adds, adds a dimension and a limitation factor, basically a break on the things you can do. And if you do them anyway, you, you're totally allowed to. But the more you do that, the, the lower humanity goes, and the more monstrous, of course, you are. And so in this game, we have the Blight, which is a similar kind of um, breaking system. So do whatever you want, but oh, you're going to get Blight, you know? And so um, uh, I, I think that, and then also we have these, uh, we have the crux system and then uh, the skills, the, the, the combat skills are based on these different one hand, two hand, um, bow, finesse. Um, so, so that it really captures, I think, the, the feeling of, um, um, you know, these different skills as you go up and rank and dots, they actually open up new actions you can do with that skill. Um, so, so suddenly, um, you're able to do these, you know, cool maneuvers that you couldn't otherwise do. And therefore hit points are not as important as someone might normally think. Well, yeah. one of the things that's in all of our books and, and we've already published last year, we did the curse of bloodstone isle, uh, and which, which was kind of the intro into lost Lorne, um, but is an Island that floats between worlds. And so even if you're not interested in lost Lorne, it's still a great set of books to pick up. Um, but but Bloodstone Isle, Badlander, Valazar, he mentioned all these upcoming books. There are penalties for murdering people, and so uh, it, in in real life, you don't just walk around and kill the guy that 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 makes you mad. And so Mark has really put into the system um, uh, penalty. I mean, legal penalties for killing people. Valazar, you don't you don't just kill people in a duel in the middle of the streets. Um, and, and so weapons that have other options than just mass damage can be really useful because you do want to defeat your opponent, but killing them just outright is kind of a bad thing. Like taking a prisoner is a better deal. Um, yeah, yeah, and, and there's a whole ransom mod. culture where, yeah. where if, you, if you basically defeat someone, they surrender, right? Then you they have to give you their oath. Right, and sometimes if you trust them enough, they have a high enough honor. You can let them walk home, or or walk to your castle or, or to your home, and surrender themselves until they get their ransom. Or or if you really trust them, let them walk to their own home, and they they've sworn to you that in ninety days they'll pay your ransom. So, and this is actually very historical, right? right. Um, this is exactly what people would do. I mean, uh, Richard the Lionhearted was held for ransom. They didn't kill him. They, they want to make money from him, right? So they they, they held him hostage. Murder um, going to jail. <laughs> and uh, and all of England had to pay this king's ransom, literally a king's ransom. And so and that's a, that's a big part of the culture in in, uh, in Lorne is that you know combat is often to first blood. Um, duels always are. If you do a duel to the death, that's incredibly illegal, and you're going to get in serious trouble, and then you're a murderer. Um, and I, I think this adds a lot of uh, depth and, and charm to the world because then when that inevitably does happen and you do kill someone in a duel, um, yeah, you got to run for it, you know? <laughs> like, like, like things change for you suddenly. And the, uh, the, <coughs> Go ahead, sorry. I was going to say the Bloodstone Isle campaign that I run on an, on an every other week basis, um, uh, there, there was a fight just a couple of weeks ago that, that the players, uh, uh, an NPC entered the fight and killed one of their opponents. And, and, and suddenly they were like, oh my gosh, that's horrible. His allies are going to come get us. And they were, they were, you know, his throat got slit and he hadn't quite died yet. And suddenly they were frantically trying to save their enemy's life because uh, there are consequences to murder. And it's one thing to like get in kind of a, you know, we'll smack you with our quarterstaff. Well, you know, you smack us around. But the minute somebody pulled a blade, it was like, oh, this just escalated to that's not mm -hmm. cool. And and that has added a dimension to gaming that, again, as Mark says, is frankly realistic. Um, you know, two guys fighting on the street with their fists is one thing. But the minute a guy pulls a, a, a blade or a gun in real life, oh, wait a second. That's, you know, <laughs> we, that, that that's you've, you have just real. escalated this to a point that it, this is no longer cool anymore. And, and that is realistic. I, I enjoy 
the level of realism that that Mark brings to Lost Lorne. It feels more real. That's- I do notice too. Speaking of realism, uh, that you're using a silver system instead of a gold system. Is that right? Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah, because gold should be gold. You know, like that, yes. that, that, it always bothered me that people were just throwing around gold like it was nothing, and and uh, and then of course as you go up in levels and in, in, uh, in a lot of games, you know, as you get more powerful, money becomes so easy to get that it, it's just worthless and no one really cares about it. You just throw it around, and and so um, we actually have a fury chapter. Uh, your nickname is a badlander, is a thorn, and so that's what the name, the sub name of the game is, a fury of thorns. Is that a fury is your team of badlanders, and so we have a fury chapter. And there's even a fury character sheet, and um, there is all these downtime things you can do. Um, and you can gain things and contacts and fame and ignominy uh, and various uh, things as a fury, as a team. And uh, and then, of course, all these downtime things can not only make you money, but you can spend money, a lot of money. So money in Badlander is always, always, always going to be in short supply. It's not something that even as you get more powerful, it's you're never going to have enough. And let's face it, that's sort of the way the real world is. I mean, unless you're a billionaire, I mean, there, even rich people feel broke sometimes, right? You True. know, and I can, you know, and that is, I can say that as someone who used to be rich, but sort of uh, gave it away and lost it all. Um, wow. You know, that even, even when I had the money, um, you know, there were times I felt really poor, uh, you know? <laughs> And and, and and because it was all tied up somewhere, and then I had this horrible moment, and I was I always chuckled to myself. It's like, oh man, like having money is like a lot of hassle, and it does <laughs> not make your life simpler. Really, it makes your life more complicated, you know. And I, I think you know there's a way to set up your life with money where that's not the case. But let's face it, most people get tied up in their money, and, and so anyway, well, I wanted to capture that. I wanted to capture like like having, um, you know. This 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 feeling that you know you're basically um, you always need more, which is I think so human. This uh, Wayfarer page right here looks pretty neat. Um, this is talking about how the uh, how the guilds and stuff actually will motivate you to do things, and that's something I I find is a problem uh, quite often with characters and, and really players more so than characters, but you know, is trying to motivate players to want to do stuff. Um, Because a lot of times, you know, people will come to the table with the expectation of, oh, well, the the GM's going to have something for us to do right away. Uh, And my preferred style of play is sandbox. So I I don't want to sit there and make stuff for the players to do. It's like, there's already tons of stuff out there you can do. I've made the world for you. All you got to do is get show some initiative and get involved um and yeah uh, yeah same here i i I feel like i'm experienced enough as a storyteller that i can kind of weave a story from anything and so i love giving the players like maximum freedom to do stuff mm -hmm. um one problem with 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 uh, a lot of games though is that by having a character class rather than a clan or a guild is that a class does not exist in the world right like mm-hmm. like you can't you, you can be a fighter as a class but then okay so then what is what does that mean in the world well you can't say oh my class is fighter that doesn't make any sense right so there's no political or real world thing of that it is but whereas in, in this world we made it oh you're a free blade you're a mercenary you sell your services as mercenaries and you have this oath that you don't betray a client and you, you, you always obey the letter of your contract, you know? And so then, therefore, you have this whole culture and feel and politics that is real. And as a player, you can mention that you're a free blade as a, in character. And that changes everything, in my opinion. It does. It just does. And, and it makes it real. It makes it in the world. And it makes it of the world. And... Uh- uh- well, towards that end, just to point out, as long as we're selling Badlander, we will make for sale again this Curse of Bloodstone Isle, which is a sandbox setting, 
but it is also designed that it can kind of serve as a campaign with a series of events that lead towards a very cataclysmic conclusion. Um, and Mark, very brilliantly, uh, I feel, uh, I, can, I can say that because I mean this, it, it plays well. There's two books. There's a player's guide and a GM's guide. And the player's guide is entirely in character. Here's this 288 page book or whatever, however big it is. And you give it to the players and say, you can read this. Your characters have read this. This is a journal that was found on the island that describes uh, uh, one explorer uh, on the island. This is what he encountered. And then the GM has their corresponding guide. And so the players can say, oh, this, this Titan's wheel sounds amazing. We should go check this out. And the GM just turns to the appropriate page and says, well, this is what you'll find when you get there. And man, that has made running a campaign so easy that the players pick where they're going. And the GM has all the tools at, at, uh, at, at their beck and call to run that. And I'm, I'm excited that future game books are, are along those lines. And boy, it just it runs itself. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we plan to do, uh, at some point, you know, um, module series of stories and all that. But but right now, we're, we're actually completely focused on the more of the sandbox type thing. And the great thing about that is that the Bloodstone is actually two different books. And one book is basically a book written in world by scholars from Lorne about Bloodstone with maps and <clears throat> stories and poetry and uh, um, sketchbook art and you just hand that to the players when they get the mission to go there to the island and you say in character well here's here's the the book um, on the island study this and know what you're doing and the players can then they have their book and they can look through that anytime they want and they can they can see that and that becomes their their resource and we'll be doing that in the future, uh, whether it will be um, one half of the, the book uh, or something. That ba but basically, uh, it'll be in-world uh, writ material written by people from the world. So your players are reading it, not just you as a player. I mean, your characters are reading it, not just you as a player. And I, I think that's a, a really cool thing. And you can only do that with Sandbox. With a story, you can't do that because you'd be giving away too much of the story, of mm -hmm. course. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I'm looking over all the different, uh, you know, birthrights, edges, and yeah. disciplines, and some of these things sound familiar to me. <laughs> uh, how so? The Athenra sound? The, the well, the, the, you know, the discipline. I mean, come on, I'm a vampire player. Oh, right now. oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I like Yeah, that. I figured I could I could use the discipline word in Badlander, but maybe I shouldn't use it in the vampire Fang Knight game. So so we use it here, and in Fang Knight, we're going to go a little bit more Ars Magica. That'll be great. Oh, man. Yeah, these are pretty cool with these uh, estates and backgrounds and stuff. Yeah, I'm super, super proud of the estates. I think it it captures a, an actual sort of cast system that feels real. And in play, it really works. Um, and what's really great about it is that, let's say you have a normal gaming group of like four or five players. Well, there's 10 estates. You can't cover them all. There's always going to be at least half of the estates that you have no one in your group who can be, who can talk for you in, right? So you're going to be an outsiders to at least half of the people you meet. And for a game master, it makes it really easy. Like when you're doing a social interaction, the first thing you do is, okay, what estate is the person they're talking to? What estate are they part of? And then how does that make them respond to the person who's talking to them? You know? Mm-hmm. And, and and it's not all like, oh, you're a royal. Everyone has to be nice to you. Well, maybe they have to be nice to you. But if you're not in the city, you don't have guards around. Is a vileborn really going to be nice to a royal? Probably not. You know, they'd be like, oh, you're a royal. But you're not from here. Well, how do, why do I care that you're a royal? You're not my royal. I'm not <laughs> obliged by law to be nice to you. So get out of my way. Scum. I didn't vote for you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God! The Monty Python quotes are coming back, aren't they? That's yeah. Hey, hey! It's not a good game or gaming group unless you have Monty Python quotes. Damn it! 
Yeah, a lot, a lot of the, a lot of the younglings uh, don't know Monty Python. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of amazed. Like, uh, <sighs> like uh, even my own kids will not watch Monty Python with me. So well, that's, oh. you know, that means you messed up there somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know I did. But uh, you know, uh, I, I'm letting them discover things on their own. Also, it's for me, it's a delightful. To keep mentioning that they've never seen like Wizard of Oz and, uh, and they can't use those metaphors <laughs> and they get so mad at me. You have seen it. I go, you never saw it to the end. That means you haven't seen it. <laughs> um, so we, you have this. This is kind of new here. This thing with shields. Yeah. How does oh, this you work? Got, uh, the shield across the page. Mm hmm. Yeah, because you got armor and you got shields and initiative and uh Yeah, those, those shields across the bottom of the character sheet uh -huh. are I think that's a really clever thing we've done where it makes it uh really simple. So armor, initiative, alertness, poise, reason. These mm -hmm. are basically the, the key stats that you need um for roles against you. And so these kind of uh you know are roles that you need to make. So these are the those are the key numbers that you need. And they're, it's easy to see, of course, because of the shape. Um, and I, I think it sort of simplifies a, a lot of stuff. Um, and, uh, yeah, in general, I'm, I'm really proud of the character sheet. I think it's not going to be too scary for people. I hope at least. No, uh, my, as I, was, I said before, I my number one goal is non scary character, character sheet. sheet. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. there, were, there was another question who said oh, that yeah. about if you scroll up the seventh, the seventh stat, what is that? Uncanny Mark, tell them about uncanny. Yeah, uncanny is basically, uh, you know, that M word I can't say. Um, um, but basically, it's your, your connection to the Dwimmer, the world of Dwimmer, which is there's seven different Dwimmer in the world from Sakra to Profana, um, Withera to um, Anulla. And these are the seven different uh, twines of, uh, of the arcane. And so, so there's I'm, something I'm, similar to the Winds of Magic from Warhammer? Um. Yeah, maybe. I, I'm. I. I don't. I'm not familiar with that offhand. Um. So. Uh. But. But basically, it's similar to in Ars Magica, um, where Warhammer did steal a fair bit from. Um. Um. <laughs> uh, we have the um different types of uh um weiss and aura magic aura. So you have div div divine. You have you know profane, and so this is sort of taken from that a little bit. And it's sort of like it makes sense out of how, you know, um, the uncanny works in the world. So your uncanny rating, though, is basically your ability to see and be there. So if you have a high uncanny rating, you automatically can see uh, what's the word we have. Uh, you can basically see people's aura. So you can see in the dark is the basic fundamental thing it gives you. So if it's high enough, you can, you're literally able to sort of see in the dark a little bit because you can see auras. And you can see the true essence of things and their dwimmer, um, and so I think it, I think it adds a, a whole lot to the game. Uh, and of course, I don't know if you've noticed, but in this game, seven is the magic number, just like three <laughs> was the magic number in World of Darkness. And we got a question from Crafty Menace: Is D twenty or dice pool? Uh, it's D twenty. Yes. Yeah. And I, I miss the, the the dice pool mechanics, but they change it anyway. Um, I personally like it where you have a difficulty, uh, the number you need to get, and you count successes. Because that way, if you have a low number of successes, you could still succeed. But storytelling-wise, it, it had a feel to it. Like, oh, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you managed to hotwire the car, but the alarms are going off. It's a cop car. And everywhere you go, you're going to have the alarms on. You can't turn them off, you know? And so it created a storytelling context to things. But, hey, they changed that anyway. People didn't like it. They felt it was too wishy-washy, which is fine. I understand. Um, so we went with D20, uh, and that's what the vast majority, 95% of the of gamers are incredibly familiar with that. And it has some good things to it. Uh, I'm not as anti-D20 as I used to be. In fact, I've grown to kind of love it because there's things I can do with it I couldn't do um, in the old systems. So, But I think we do D20 in a way that's really fresh and new 
And uh, and the great thing is also D20s are a great dice. And because we're, we have all the, pol the damage that are polyhedrals, you get to roll all your different dice. And, and let's face it, that's something that in my earlier career with, with World of Darkness, you know, like we only had the D10s. And, you know, so there's something about gaming having all these different polyhedrals, mm -hmm. which is <laughs> silly, but fun. It's fun. Kick, clack, the math rocks. You know, <laughs> uh so... So we basically kept all the D, all the polyhedrals. You get all well, of them. You use all of them. Our friend Greg has got to take off, man. Greg, hey, thank you for being on today. I appreciate it. I know this is kind of you had to take some time out to do this, and yeah, no problem. I appreciate you having me on. No, anytime, thanks, man. You, you're, you're always welcome. Yeah, thanks again. Uh, oh, and we got another question here. So it's stat plus ability plus dice versus target numbers. Basically, the cores of ours Magicka. Yep. Yeah, yeah. T uh, Jonathan it. definitely copied it in the D and D uh, third, and it's still there, right? Mm -hmm. It's your proficiency bonus, and if you see the dots, that that basically is your the same proficiency bonus you have in D and D. Um, you know, we just don't have negatives. Although, by the way, if you do have negative. You just put the X on the dot, and that means you have a negative. Um, so attribute abilities can be negative. But yeah, this is basically what we did in Ars Magica, and it was and what it's what I did in World and Storyteller System, World of Darkness, right? So so basically, he took it one direction, I took it the other, and then here we have the two sort of um, uh, you know sort of. Uh, you know, vast systems meeting each other again. These, these, uh, these. What's it called? The currents, currents in the ocean meeting and joining <laughs> up again. And uh, yeah, no, there's degrees of success. Uh, um, basically, uh, you basically there's the thresholds are five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five. So if the threshold was fifteen, and then you get a twenty, then that's a higher degree of success. And the, the storyteller can say. Uh, that, that something happens. Uh, also, we have uh, even if you fail, you might succeed because obviously, if it's a detective type story, you can't really fail without the whole story derailing. So the idea is then that in those situations is that you succeed, but all these terrible things happen. So you of course get the clue, but all these bad things happen as well, and that happens if you score under the threshold. So uh, it's sort of a simpler system because you're not doing these middle difficulty numbers all the time, like in D&D, &D, oh, it's a 17, it's an 18. Of course, that can happen in combat. But in general, you just say, oh, it's 15, 20. And then um, if they fail to get the full, you can say to them, oh, I'll let you succeed. It costs you a drama stone, but there's going to be all kinds of conditions. So I got to ask, do you have crits and fumbles? Yeah, actually, we uh, I have we, I have what I consider to be a very clever system. Uh, it's not with a if you roll a one that does lose you a crux. It's a it's a it's a it's a terrible thing. But a fumble, you get it when you roll a thirteen and you fail your roll. Ah. So if it's a difficult thing to do and a thirteen is a fail, then if you roll a thirteen, that is a fumble. But a thirteen is a success then it's not a fumble. So 13 is a number you never want to roll because if you do, <laughs> that's going to be a, a critical failure. Matt, Matt asked the question, are the, are the dots plus one? They are, they are. It's attribute plus ability plus D20. And the attributes are going to be familiar. If your dexterity has a value of 16, then you will have three dots in dexterity. So that will be very familiar to 5e players. So the dots are basically just the attribute bonus from 5e That's, or 3 It's points. exactly it. It's an easy, if you're familiar with 5e, this is a familiar system that you'll pick up almost instantly. I have a question about the, what was it, the crux system? Yeah. yeah. Uh, does, like the different things you face, I don't know what type of monsters you have, but say like a goblin or a dragon or an ogre, would they all have the same crux level or does it uh, change? No, no, they would have, they. Uh, but basically everyone starts out with zero crux. Right, but then uh, as the crux dice is a giant d6 on the table, as it goes up from one to two to three to four to six, and once it gets a six, the other side has to make a morale roll. So their morale, the different monsters can have different morale ratings depending on how well they can work together or how brave they are. And some monsters will have a low morale. So if you can just 
somehow manage some monsters if you just get them to force me a morale roll. <coughs> their their bravery is such that they'll run away more than likely because they have low morale. So it's Other kind ones, of like an armor class, but for courage. Yes, yes. Okay. And yeah, and, and sometimes they'll run away and sometimes they'll surrender. Right? Like surrendering is safer than running away because you won't get arrows in your back. <laughs> so and that that and that's where you know almost every everborn is going to assume that you're gonna ransom them. <coughs> now is that uh is the crux system can it affect the players or is it Oh yeah, no the the, 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 see, uh, the bad guys the if they get the six on their crux dice and you you're you're low on your crux dice then you have to make a morale roll one of your players makes a little speech makes a morale roll if they fail it you, you guys either have to surrender or run away or you have to do something extreme to stay there so yeah the, the players in my play test the players ran away a fair bit and in a way the the, the system kind of gave them an excuse to do so right like players will never run away <laughs> In a normal <laughs> game, right? Because it's just considered no. <laughs> like, oh, we just don't do that, right? But if you give them an excuse, oh, you run away now, and then they can challenge that, maybe not, but it's just an excuse. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, we, yeah, okay, yeah, we run away. Then, then it, it kind of is, uh, you know, a cool thing. Or surrender. Surrender's great in storytelling. It's great to start your next game session in the dungeon. Oh, yeah. You know, and so this is a, a way to do that with, without making the players feeling like you're forcing them into it because, well, that actually happened in the combat. That was, that, that was a thing. That's an event that happened. And I have one more question about the crux system. I'm sorry if I keep because I no really, this system is very interesting to me and I want to know much more about it. Is there a way to affect it? Like, let's say you build more of like a support cleric style thing or bard thing where I could affect Yeah, the, the spinsters in particular have a huge number of edges and disciplines that let them affect crux. Okay, because I tend to lean towards support style characters, so this is Yeah, yeah, really this, 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 this is how we did our buffing, is a lot of our buffing uh, is about the crux system. So the avowed, which is our kind of our cleric types a, a bit, um, you know, they do that. Um, um, the spinsters are kind of... Uh, um, have it as well, and a few others can affect it in different ways. So, uh, Nathan says, "Do we do we roll armor class, uh, or is it opposed rolls? It is armor class, isn't it? Yeah, we have armor class, but it's basically just done as a uh, the difficulty number for an attack roll. Yeah, yeah. There should be enough familiar for five E players that they can hit the ground running. That was kind of the goal." was to not do an entirely new system, but enough familiar that they don't feel flat-footed, but at the same point, enough different that it's innovative, it's fun, it changes some things that people may not have enjoyed about 5e. Uh, it's kind of, the goal was the best of both worlds. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and hopefully we hit it, and if we didn't, we're going to fix it. <laughs> I'll be completely honest that that is how game design works. It's iteration. Um, and, um, you know, uh, we didn't get Vampire right the first edition, but I think that this is going to be the best first edition I've ever done. I mean, at this point... But I'm not going to lie, it's not the last edition. <laughs> <You know? laughs> But that's why we want to get people's reaction. We want to get, you know, you only can get proper amount of playtesting by having hundreds, if not thousands of people out there in the world playing it and giving you feedback. You know, that that is, you know, unless you're, of course, you know, 5e D&D &D, where they literally had thousands and thousands of people playtesting their rule set, which was what a, I wish I had that. <laughs> Often my favorite editions are either first or second. Because in the first edition, you feel like people are really trying to sell you the setting and all their passion mm -hmm. is on the page. You know, they're really excited about this concept and yeah. want to get it across to you. And then the second edition, maybe they refine, you know, the, the rules a bit more. But that, that first edition always tends to have a, a special place to me. Mm -hmm. This has been more of a punk aesthetic with like the first edition where like, you know, we're banging this out. Let's get it out. And then the second edition, they kind of refine it a bit, and that's where it really yeah. tried. It's yeah, been in development for a few years. It's been Mark's been working on this for for a long time, over two years. Um, I joined two years ago, and it was already being written. So, 
Oh, crap. Yeah, you would not believe how long it took to write this game. But, uh, you know, we're setting up the the groundwork for everything to come. So we have on the schedule, like, you know, seven games more, you know, a bunch of other supplements (laughs) and settings and, and, uh, uh, you know, sandboxes and uh, world books. And so, you know, we, we have a lot coming. And so now everything's sort of set up for this Still hiring freelancers? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. Join the team. We have a join us page, uh, which uh, I guess uh, we can post here. It's, it's lostlorngames.com, uh, and there's a join us, and we're really interested always in having people join us. Um, unfortunately, we can't pay until after the Kickstarter because that's when we get our money. It's and the we labor write, of love. And we write things before the Kickstarter, so, but but hopefully, as we get more and more going, then we'll be able to you know build up a, 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 a you know a nest egg and, and pay people more normally. Um, but 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 our goal is to you know work with our people like like you know like we want um, you know my goal is is I would once again love to be the 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 sandbox in which a whole new generation of game creators and designers come out of. And, you know, and, and, you know, I'm not jealous. I want people to be successful and, and, and doing mm-hmm. their own thing. And, and they can do that while still contributing to our stuff. It's, we're not exclusive. Yeah. We're not asking people to be exclusive, but we, we are saying that we will teach people the best that we know. And if someone more experienced wants to join us, that's awesome because they're, they can join with me in helping other people understand how the industry works. And, and, you know, I honestly, truly want people to be, successful and to have their own projects and and to teach people how to be um professional game designers and artists and um and other roles in a, in a game company because you know it's a pretty wonderful life right <laughs> you know like, like you to do what you love life. man <coughs> we've got a couple more questions here and uh let's see and we're we 10 that. minutes away from the countdown so uh yes. it starts in 10 minutes Pretty exciting. This is gaming fixes the herald affects the crowd. Oh yeah, the herald. I knew I was missing one. Yeah, the herald. Totally, yeah, the herald is the big crux guy. So yeah, the herald is the talker. It's the lawyer guy. It's the it's the, it's the speech guy. Um, I shouldn't say guy, I guess, but um, um, but yeah, it's the whole it's the whole thing where uh, you know, um, um, the herald is. Literally, I shouldn't say my favorite, but I just think it's such a unique uh, take for a fantasy game, right? Someone who talks, you know, but I, I, I think we, we, we nailed it. Because the, the, the hard thing about games is that when you give someone powers that are talking, then the game gamer doesn't talk. They just roll <laughs> dice instead of talking, and you want the, the player to talk, right? If your yes. character is a talker, you want the player to talk, at least some. So there's a careful balance there, and I think we nailed it. Where the player talks, but they also make roles, and they can get people to do things with their with their honeyed words. And uh, <laughs> it's pretty phenomenal the shit you can do. And it's it's I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. I, I would definitely play a herald. I I think people will enjoy the set. There's seven attributes and there's seven guilds, and it's not so simplistic as to say heralds or charisma, dusk watcher. Uh, dexterity, free blades, or strength, but there is something to be said that each of the guilds is, is pretty good with one of the one of the seven attributes, and uh, and that can be an easy easy way in. Having said that, of course, like with with you know any good game, you could play a, a dusk watch and make it charisma based instead of dexterity based. Um, but there is that ease in that that the seven guilds have seven roles that they kind the, the kind of standard familiar roles that old school gamers will enjoy um that 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 are will be familiar so crafty matt you're asking if we got criticism yes some people are like there's no way i'm ever playing 5e i don't play D D. yada 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 <laughs> all, all i can say to them is that you know imagine if you had a storyteller or you know um uh, alternate you know, RPG type system, but you could basically pull in any player in gaming because they will be familiar enough with the system. They won't be scared of it. Right. That's why we did it is that basically, you know, this is like, uh, this is like a, a, 
a boutique RPG game system built on top of 5e. And so that if there's a player you have who would never play any of your power by the apocalypse or vampire or anything else, because this player only does D20, they only don't want D D and D, they only understand that. With this system, you can get them to play and be in your group, and you're not gonna have any problems. And your other players who like, you know, the dots or they like, you know, more, you know, innovative rule system, they're not gonna be put off by this, except by the name. And eventually, we're going to basically take away the 5e name. Once they go to 5e uh, 0. 5, 5.5, they're not going to have the open game license anymore. They're taking it away. Open game license is gone in 2024. The new D&D will not be open game license, and therefore we will stop being um, open game license, and we'll take this whole system off in its, our own direction completely. And then once we start doing that, then it'll be still be D20, because there's nothing wrong with D20, but it will become more and more of a storytelling uh, non-5e type system. And um, yeah, so so that, that's that's sort of the, the goal. We're five minutes out to the countdown. I'm I'm so anxious and excited. <laughs> <laughs> um this is kind of curious here, this uh, system of uh, advancement based on experience points or story base. Uh, how are you working this? I mean, just, because I'm yeah, right I mean, for at, at first, we didn't have experience points at all. It was just like you go up and level and rank when the, when the, the, the tail spinner tells you. But then I decided to make it a push your luck system. So remember those, uh, those drama stones I told you about? Well, mm -hmm. those converted. If you those are left over, if you didn't use them during the game, these stones you get basically for role playing. Um, uh, but you basically any of those stones that you keep at the end of the game get turned into experience points. So basically, you don't want to use the drama stones to, to push your luck or to save your ash. You want to save them so you can go up and rank. And so I think it adds a whole push your luck quality to the game, which I think is going to be a lot of fun. But it's low numbers. It's not you're not counting up thousands of numbers. Experience points are like one, two, or three, basically, and then ah. you collect them. You and you collect as much as you need in your ranks. Um, so, 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 so um, that is the whole way it's going to work. So I, I think it's it's a cute system, but honestly, you can just make it by game master fiat. If you wanted to, you go, you all go up and rank on you know every other game session or whatever you want to say but the experience points is, is just another thing for people to kind of hack and uh and anyway i just i love push your luck mechanics i think it adds a lot of drama to the game you know basically imagine the players arguing do they spend the drama stone or not we're well, spending our experience points <laughs> you know and then and then, the then, 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 then you know that, but there could be a total party wipeout Right. We have to take the chance, you know? And then that way, if there is a total party wipeout, they feel responsible. They feel like, oh, well, we, we, that, we took the risk, and, well, it failed. I, I, I like the drama stones. They, they've been... My wife, Mark, I don't know if I told you for Christmas, my uh, wife got out and bought me six bloodstones to use as, oh, drama, wow. as drama stones. And I was very happy to... I mean, they're not super expensive, but because of Bloodstone Isle... Uh, yeah, my, yeah, drama, yeah. my drama stones are bloodstones. That's fantastic. Cool. Yes. Oh, here's something. Do you level up or spend XP to increase individual stats? That's a curious one. Uh, it's both. Um, so you're you actually every time uh, you can get uh, uh, every game session you can run it where you get points to add to your skills. Um, or when you go up in rank, you get points to add to your skills, but your max skill level is restricted by your rank. So you can go up to six. Um, six dots just means you have five dots, and then you put a line across, and that means you're up to six. So it actually goes from zero to six, and um, the rank you are restricts how high up your skills can go and your abilities. So, um, um, so they can go up, but, but it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a gradual thing. But you go up in the ways that you want. So instead of having a general skill proficiency or weapon proficiency, these are actual skills with dots, with a number from zero to six, basically. 
and and it goes up. But you're restricted by your rank. Um, and uh, the way the ranks work is that um, after uh, you have 10 ranks as an adept, and at, by the 10th level adept, you're pretty much close to, I think you're at max skill dots. But when you go to master ranks, which is another 10 ranks, there's no more hit points. Hit points don't go up anymore. You're tapped out. But your powers go up. So basically, combat still stays very intense and um, you know uh, powerful because you don't get more hit points, but you can deal out more damage, perhaps, and you can do more things. So, but it, it makes tension the combat remain tension filled rather than boring, which I think is the problem with higher level uh, Pathfinder and D and D is that no one wants to play after tenth level certainly. But we already went over that. Sorry. Choo choo. No, no. I mean, you're you're still right about that though. Yeah. Um, there there does seem to be a a lack of high level play. Um, and that's kind of sad because, like I said, a lot of good stuff is gated behind that. Well, I okay. I'm back. By the way, uh, I think the biggest issue with high level play is it's just so slow with the D and D system. Yeah, yeah, and I think our combat is way, way faster. Um, oh, by the way, it's ten fifty nine. So I'm going to go um, uh, over. We have uh, less than a minute, so I'm going to go over to the the thing and get ready to launch. Um, Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Hopefully I can just <laughs> pre press this button. All right. Um launch project. Okay. Um Ooh. calling it five I just put it in the chat as well. 40, 41, 42, 43. Oh my gosh. Uh I am <laughs> I've never wanted a Kickstarter to succeed more than this one, let me tell you. I'm just hey, praying we're right behind you. The first hour. We found in the first hour. Please. Okay, 56, 57, 58, 59. There we go. I'm launching. I press the button. I'm refreshing. I'm <laughs> refreshing. Let's see. There we go. Okay. It's up. It's up. Badlander. Holy smokes. Oh, I love it. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Years of work you've put into this, Mark. Just years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really I mean, is. And and, I, <laughs> and 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 what a journey to go from your your D and D campaign talking about old school to go from your D and D campaign from so many years ago, and now you're releasing it for people to to join you on after all these years. Yeah, yeah, and, and the fact that it was weirdly like my D and D campaign, then it turned into Ars Magica. Which sort of turned into vampire in a way. A lot of the ideas got there, and then now it's sort of full circle. Um, yeah, it's wild. Uh, you know, I never thought I would do fantasy again. To be honest, I I thought I was done. But um, I got to thank Game of Thrones and for making me realize that fantasy still had, you know, was still could be amazing. You know, and even though the later seasons didn't turn out the way all, all some of us wanted, uh -huh. the, those first three four seasons were pretty amazing the books i still love them oh lord patron nova <laughs> oh yeah we got yeah some to be honest you, you put in those really high numbers to make the lower numbers seem less big <laughs> you know so we, we don't really expect anyone to do that unless uh well you never know it would be really really nice i'll put it that way but uh, um, yeah, it's it's you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pretend uh, a lot of people. So, but yeah, I think the sweet spot is if if you do have the money, 250 gets you all the physical product, all the books that we have, and uh, everything extra. It's and it's 40 bucks off, so it's pretty it's pretty amazing. It's it's limited, uh, very limited though. But I know that's a, that's a lot of money for people, so. Um, I want to throw. I want to throw out the the two. We've got the the sixty five level is the Badlander book, the hardcover book, and at uh, uh, at the one hundred and twenty level, we get the Badlander book and the physical books of Bloodstone Isle. That is a sweet deal right there. 
uh, a, uh, the full campaign setting for Bloodstone Isle. Those that 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 one twenty is a very sweet deal. Like like the value of those books, the value of, of Bloodstone is is far more than just that that amount of tack on. So it's a good it's a good sale. I've got the dog. I think Green Gay is still dealing with the dog. Um, wow. <laughs> Yeah, that cool. poster looks pretty hot, right? Yeah, I love it does. that poster. Um, Try to see what my broke ass is going to be able to afford. Right, right. <laughs> oh, no, tighten, get down. Tighten it down. Green Gay, we can still hear you, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. My dog is kind of jumping on me. So, Aw. What a guy. He's excited about Bad or she is excited about Badlander. That's a good thing. No, he just doesn't realize he's 80 pounds. <laughs> it's quite expensive for a dog. Wow. Wow. Well, we got to launch this with you, man. I'm that's so cool. Never got to do that before. Yeah, absolutely. This is uh fantastic. And uh thanks for having us on. Uh we had a good time. I hope I didn't bore yeah. anyone too much. No. I think no, most sorry people... I had so many difficulties. You're in charge of the weather. How dare you, Grim? <laughs> yeah. Well, I... I think what it actually was... Well, we had a brief power cut, and then that seemed to screw everything up. And then I think my video card was overheating trying to do the camera. So, yeah, fun. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, man. But I've, got, I've got to go and make dinner now. So it was nice seeing you again, Mark. Uh, yeah, hey, great talking to you and having you in part of it. Yeah, and, maybe, uh, maybe I'll be in touch incognito about some freelance work. <laughs> cool, yeah. cool. Same. <laughs> All right. See you guys. Take care. All right. Bye bye. All right. Well, like I said, this is like, uh, this is pretty awesome, man. This has like been over 20 years in the making. <laughs> I finally get to meet you. And, and on, on the day when you're, you're launching your, your newest, biggest product. So we already got a thousand bucks, it looks like. That's amazing. All right. Wow. Yeah, I so, was hitting yeah. that refresh button waiting for it to be able to nice. Nice. Yeah, I, I get so anxious. Uh and this is the worst ever. I'm just so anxious. And I don't get anxious. This is the funny thing. I'm like a real like one thing I love about getting older is that I've gotten so mellow and so non drama, right? In my own life at least. Um, but right now I'm feeling it. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I'm feeling it strong. <laughs> All right. I think I'm going to get going. Uh, I got um, someone. My mother has a friend coming, and I promised to cook them lunch. So, All right. Uh, I'll bring my laptop wherever I go and uh, be refreshing. But uh, thank you, everyone, for watching. And please consider uh, you know, backing us at any level, even a $1. It would be so appreciated. It helps the algorithm huge. Um, we have your email that way. We won't spam you. Uh, we are going to be sending out uh, basically a weekly newsletter, a free newsletter with all kinds of free stuff. So you definitely want to be in our mailing list if at all possible. And um, we'll talk to you later. All right. Thank you, Mark. Nice Take care. Thank you so much for having us. Both oh, no you. problem. Very grateful. And uh, all you guys out there in the chat, hey, thank you for hanging out with us for a couple of hours. We really appreciate you. And, you know, if you if you enjoyed this content, hey, make sure you throw us a subscribe because <laughs> getting to a thousand is taking forever. <laughs> but until next time, we'll see you all later. Bye bye. Hey. Bye bye. Attention the